Good morning. Today we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 3 again, part 2. And this is the aspect of faith. The devil tempts us seeking to destroy our faith, but God tests us to develop our faith because faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. False faith withers like grass in the desert when trials come. But true faith has deep roots and it grows and brings glory to God. Daniel 3 verses 13 to 23. God is worthy of faith that is committed and steadfast with obedience even when powerful threats try to destroy our faith, even with the, the challenge of death. See, today we're going to see that Nebuchadnezzar gives Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego a second chance to compromise their faith or die. See, Nebuchadnezzar challenges any god to be able to rescue someone from his power. But these three Judean youth who've grown up as teenagers and now into young adulthood remain faithful even in the face of a horrible execution. Remember, the, the big band started playing, and everyone had to fall to their knees and worship the gold statue, and whoever did not go to their knees and worship it had to be pitched into the roaring furnace and then they were told that there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have placed in high positions in the province of Babylon. These men are ignoring you, O king. They don't respect your gods, and they won't worship the gold statue that you have set up. Verses 13 to 23. Furious, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought in. See, they weren't there. And when the men who brought them in, then Nebuchadnezzar asked, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? that you don't respect my gods and refuse to worship the gold statue that I have set up? I'm giving you a second chance. But from now on, when the big band strikes, you must go to your knees and worship the statue that I have made. And if you don't worship it, you will be pitched into a roaring furnace no questions asked. Who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king Nebuchadnezzar. Your threats mean nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from your roaring furnace and anything else you might cook up, O king. But even if he doesn't, it wouldn't matter a bit 
make any difference, O king, we still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you set up. Nebuchadnezzar, his face purple with anger, cut off Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, and he ordered the furnace fired up seven times hotter than usual. He ordered some strong men from the army to tie them up, hands and feet, and throw them into the roaring furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bound hand and foot, fully dressed from head to toe, were pitched into the roaring fire because the king was such in such a hurry and the furnace was so hot, flames from the furnace killed the men carrying Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Meshach and Abednego, while the furnace raged around Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we'll find out the conclusion next week. But see, these three were unmoved. Their faith was deep. It was rooted. It was real. See, Nebuchadnezzar had planned to unify his kingdom. Hey, if we all believe the same thing, think the same way, we are going to be unified. That's the kind of argument that you not only hear from Nebuchadnezzar, but sometimes from countries, from companies, even from churches and organizations. Think the same way or else. The alternatives were to fall down before the image and worship or to die. It was life or death. There was no middle ground. And Nebuchadnezzar was furious with rage. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't visible. They weren't around the statue. It would have been obvious for, to all. But they were the leadership of the province of Babylon. They weren't there. But the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the, the, these people that wished they were in charge and resented these three Jews being in charge over them, they're the ones who let it be known that they didn't bow down. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar says, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the image? He didn't know. He's given him a second chance. What God could rescue you from me? And they just said, we don't need to defend ourselves. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us. He is able. That is the source of their faith. He is, they are believing that God is able to do whatever is needed. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, Nebuchadnezzar, that we won't serve. And this made him furious. Normally in an execution, you humiliate the person. But Nebuchadnezzar was so angry. They probably would have been stripped of their fine clothes or completely naked, tied and thrown in like scoundrels. That's what they like to do to you, humiliate you. But these three were very bold and 
Nebuchadnezzar was very angry. And these three fell into the furnace. God is uncomparable to all the false gods. And when we say false gods, we often think of other religions. But there are other false gods. You can have a secular religion that is a false god. It's not real. That's pretty much what Caesar worship was all about. Julius Caesar went to the, the Nile with Cleopatra and liked the idea that the Egyptians thought she was a god. And he comes back and he brings that to Rome. And the Romans aren't going to have it. So they kill Julius Caesar. But then the next emperor begins to uh, think of himself in divine terms. See, you can be a false god, no religion at all. It can be a religion of ideas that you have to conform to. That God is able to rescue those who faithfully serve him. God is able. God is not required to save, but he is able despite doubts. And God is worthy of our, the ultimate sacrifice of worship, giving our lives if we are called to give it. That's a hard one. People are afraid to die. But if you really put your trust in God, you know that as soon as you die, you're with God. What can they do to me? All they can do is take your life. God is able to save, and he is compared to these false gods who can do absolutely nothing. False gods are ways of manipulating people to do what they want you to do. We have a plethora of false gods in America today. We have them in the world today. And we're not talking about other world religions. We're talking about ideologies ways of controlling people. You've got to do what I tell you to do. But be committed to the God who is able and to a God who is worthy of complete and total sacrifice. See, these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're not trying to get you to idolize them. Oh, if I could only be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No, that's not the purpose of this message. The purposes of this story is to dare you to believe that God, the God who created you, the God who sustains you, the God who saved you through his son, Jesus Christ, is worthy of your fidelity. And he will be with you, and you can trust him. There is a man that many of you are familiar with. In America, we didn't know a whole lot about Nelson Mandela until he was released. And it seemed to be a release of information or maybe a greater interest in what he was all about. 
But Nelson Mandela lived from 1918 to 2013. And he's a nonviolent reformer, kind of a Martin Luther King of South Africa, a politician, a philanthropist in South Africa, who eventually became president. So from prison to president, and he was president from 1994 to 1999. From his teens, he had remarkable courage. He believed in freedom. He believed in God. He believed in freedom from oppression. And he's most clearly remembered in this quote. I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not the one who dares not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. See, we all have fear. When somebody tells you, you do what I tell you to do, or you could die, you have a sense of fear. But you can overcome that fear with faith and confidence in someone who is bigger, stronger, and has always existed, and who made you and sustained you. How do you handle difficult and impossible situations? By knowing that God is greater than our fears. And serving God is worth the ultimate sacrifice if it's required. So you're not looking to die, but you're willing to die because you really believe in something that is real and bigger than yourself. Sacrifice could mean small things such as living in less opulence while serving God, or it means paying the ultimate price like Peter who was crucified upside down for his faith, or Polycarp, even in the face of torture and mutilation and death. According to Christian tradition, Polycarp was taken from his home by the Roman authorities and bravely faced trials, threats, and eventually burning at the stake, remaining strong in his trust that God would give him the strength so that he could endure the fire. Though God does not always grant deliverance in this lifetime, he always faithfully grants eternal deliverance for those who trust in him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to Nebuchadnezzar, that they could not give in. They would not worship their God. They would not bow to them. And this only fueled Nebuchadnezzar's rage. See, Nebuchadnezzar was not divine in his understanding of himself. But he saw himself as the king of kings and the lord of lords, and you did obeisance and you prostrated yourself face down when you went into his presence. But these Judeans were not so respectful once they have been told that they had to either bow or or die. They said, King, we don't fear you. All you can do is take my life. No matter what the cost, they were going to serve God. 
If we're thrown in the fire, God is able to save us. And they chose to remain loyal to God instead of being loyal to themselves. There's all kinds of rationale you could say to yourself. Well, what difference does it matter if I kneel just once? See, there is no room for wiggle, no wriggle room for not con total complete obedience to God and to loving him and serving him only. Nebuchadnezzar's image changed when he heard these words. It's the same word as the image on the face of the statue of gold that he has set up. It's a, a play on words in Hebrew and Chaldee. But they were not going to worship that image and they were not going to bow to the image of Nebuchadnezzar. They were thrown urgently with their clothes on, which seemed rash and crazy, but ironically only enhances the miracle that God is about to do. They were firmly tied and fell into this smelting furnace of thousands of degrees of heat. It was so hot that these big strong army guys that were throwing them in were instantly killed by getting that close to the heat. They survived that. And we will see next week how much more they survived. They overcame their doubts. They put their faith firmly in God's hands and that God was the reason and purpose for their willingness to sacrifice it all. They had doubts, but they did not give in to their doubts. They realized that God may not choose to deliver them. And in real life, sometimes, most of the time, God doesn't deliver us from the hardships of following him. Sometimes they're really not so hard. You choose God over wealth. You choose God over something else. And you see the blessings in your life. But it's important to realize that sometimes there are consequences for doing the right thing. You could lose your job. You could be canceled by our, the religious thought of the current age. You could be expelled for not thinking the way everyone else thinks. You could die. See, sometimes people think that you have to have faith. And if it doesn't happen and that you've received deliverance, there is something wrong with your faith or there's something wrong in your life. That's just not so. 
In the 1980s, there was a church movement called the Vineyard in Southern California. One of my good friends was a music pastor at one of the vineyards. We disagreed about this, but as time wore on, the reality of life proved this teaching wrong. See, there was a guy named John Wember who left Calvary Chapel in 1982 and thought that if you're really close and real with God, there are always going to be miracles. God will always deliver you. There is no, no way. There's got to be something wrong if you don't get delivered from sickness or, or injury or, or whatever you've got going. And then John Wimber got cancer. And that changed everything because they're thinking that because of their lack of faith that he got cancer just didn't fit reality. There was no sin in his life. I'm encouraging you to dare to believe that our God is worthy to be trusted you will either be delivered in this life or in the next. But laying down your life for faith in Christ is the most important thing you may be challenged to do. Stephen, Peter, Polycarp, and many others faced torture and death. God does not always grant deliverance in this life, but he always grants it for those who trust in him. It does not mean that you do not have enough faith. It does not mean that there's something wrong in your life. It means that God is in control and that God has a different plan than the one you want. Hebrews chapter 11 is a chapter of the Bible that's devoted entirely to people who have faith. In verse 32, following, he talks about God's people who experience through faith. And he says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions and quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again, Others, he goes on, were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned and they were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy for them. The world was not worthy for them. 
These are the special people in God's Hall of Fame. Not that they were delivered, but they remain faithful even in the midst of trials and pain. There's a poem, and the title of it is, He Maketh No Mistake. We don't know who wrote it, but it's a good one. My father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But in my soul, I'm glad to know he maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray. My hopes may fade away. But still I'll trust my Lord to lead, for he doth know the way. Though might be dark, and it may seem that day will never break, I'll pin my faith, my all in him. He maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see. My eyesight's far too dim. But come what may, I'll tr simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by the mist will lift. The plan it all he'll make through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. In light of all this, there is another important dimension, and it's found in Romans chapter 13. We are called to uh, to be good people as, as good citizens. Verse chapter 13, verse 1, be a good citizen. All governments are under God. Insofar as there is peace and order, it's God's order. So live responsibly as a citizen. And if you're irresponsible to the state, then you're irresponsible to God. And God will hold you responsible. Duly constituted authorities are only a threat if you're trying to get away with something. Decent citizens should have nothing to fear. Do you want to be on good terms with the government? Be responsible. Be a responsible citizen and you'll get on just fine. The government working to your advantage. But if you're breaking the rules, right and left, watch out. The police aren't there just to be admired in their uniforms. God also has an interest in keeping order, and he uses them to do it. That's why you must live responsibly, not just to avoid a punishment, but also because it's the right way to live. The Sanhedrin ordered the disciples to stop teaching the resurrection of Christ. And the apostles responded, we must obey God rather than human beings. See, we're supposed to be responsible citizens, listen and obey, show respect, up to the point where they tell you to bow down and worship an idol that you cannot worship or deny you the, the privilege of proclaiming the good news that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. Peter simply said, we must obey God rather than human beings. And God will give us his Holy Spirit if we are in a relationship with him. His Holy Spirit lives within our hearts. 
in 2 Timothy makes it very clear. 1 verse 7, For the Spirit of God gave us does not make us timid. The Spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. We shouldn't be sheepish. We should speak boldly. We should be bold like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. Come what may, we are going to face the challenges to our faith and serve him no matter what the cost. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have decisions to make not unlike what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to make thousands of years ago. We have to decide to listen and obey God rather than men. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be good citizens. But when it comes to denying our God and his Christ, we cannot and we will not do that. Give us strength and guide us with your Holy Spirit that we might know the difference. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.